Well, welcome to this uh, conversation with Alex Holmes. My name's Liz Watson and I'm a, a long-standing meditator in the UK living down in London. And I'm going to have a conversation with Alex, Alex Holmes, who is a long-time UK meditator living up in Scotland. And uh, we were chatting a while ago and trying to remember when it was that we met and we couldn't quite remember, but thought it was probably about 15 years ago. And the occasion of that first meeting was when I was helping to lead an essential teaching weekend up in Scotland where Alex was a participant. And I don't know whether you remember that, Alex. No, I, I remember it very well. And that, that anxiety of, because in those days, essential teaching weekends, all the participants had to give a five minute talk, or five or 10 minute introductory talk. Um, and having got that, <clears throat> having got that out of the way, later you were very um, supportive uh, in the talk I'd given. And I guess out of that conversation we had subsequently, um, I ended up um, sharing some teaching weekends with you, leading teaching weekends with you. Um, yes, and se several years ago now. <laughs> so yes, that very much emerged from that that first encounter we had in Scotland. Um, neither of us could quite remember when it was. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting, isn't it, how important encouragement is, and that's part of what the community does. We, in we encourage each other. And um, of course, we bumped into each other at various community events along the way. And I've had cause to be in contact with you again recently for another reason and that's because one of the other things you do is to carve and sculpt stone and you are going to be carving a memorial stone for my husband's uh, grave and i have to say it gives me great pleasure to ask someone who knew my husband and who's part of the community to do that so there are a whole variety of ways aren't there which as members of the community we interact <clears throat> And um, one of the things I perhaps should have said earlier on that Alex is the national coordinator for Scotland. So obviously deeply embedded in the work of the community and the teaching of the, of the community. Um, and clearly has many parts because I've mentioned one of the others. <laughs> but this conversation is about a particular passion of Alex's, which is his work with refugees in Calais. And maybe I should just say briefly, uh, Calais, um, if you're in Europe, you'll recognize that very quickly, but Calais is a port on the coast of France. And it's had long historical significance because the shortest distance between England and France is this little stretch of water between Calais on the French side and Dover on the English side. Uh, and you can see one from the other. So England is visible, I think, from Calais, and it's therefore a place where there's a, a definite border, a, a border with a sea stretch, and where refugees from the great landmass to the east of France can end up, and that's where Alex likes to spend a good deal of his time, and that's what we're going to, well, I'm here really just to facilitate Alex being able to talk about that. And he's given it the title where is home, meditation and accompanying refugees? Where is home, meditation and accompanying refugees? So Alex, tell us what it is that you're doing at the moment. Well, I'm, I'm just on a little break from, I spent the month of, of July in, in Calais. And just to you know, give you an idea or people an idea of what I do, um, when I'm there, my base is a very small house in a back street of Calais called Maria Skopsova House. And it's named after Maria Skopsova, who was a remarkable woman. She was a Russian woman who escaped um, revolution, the revolution in, in, in 1917. And she came to Paris. And she, Paris then was full of refugees who'd, who'd come west from Russia. And she opened her house to destitute refugees in Paris. 
And when the Nazis invaded France in, in 1940, she started helping Jewish people. And tragically, she ended up being um, taken off to Ravensbrück and, and gassed for her, her, her helping, helping the Jewish community. Um, and she's recognized as a saint within the Russian Orthodox Church. So there's this little house in the back street named of Calais, named after Maria Skovsova. And the house is very much run within the, within the sort of guiding idea of the Catholic worker movement. So which in turn was started by another very inspiring woman, Dorothy Day in the 1930s. Dorothy Day and her friend Peter Morin, who at a time of great economic um, downturn in America, she was opening up houses of hospitality for destitute people. So the house in Calais, it's a small house, and it offers safe sanctuary to a very small number of particularly vulnerable refugees. It's a, it's, it's a house of hospitality, it's a house of community, it's a house of safe sanctuary, and very fundamentally, it's also a house of prayer. So that is my base when I'm there, and I've been going there as a volunteer since 2016. But my, my work, the focus of my volunteering there has kind of shifted in the last year. Um, I'm still very much based in the house, which is a very busy house, and there's you know, always lots of work to do, from cleaning to shopping to taking people to the hospital, just sitting and being with people, and eating with them and praying with them, um, with the guests in the house. But I, the real focus of my work has become what I would call outreach work. The first community served by the house, or uh, well, very early on in the days of the house, um, it, the, the, the young people coming to live in the house for short periods of time was the Eritrean refugee community, members of the Eritrean refugee community in Calais. And just over a year ago, the house needed to briefly close. And when it reopened, the, the, the community most in need of support a year and a bit ago was women and children. But I very much have wanted to maintain that connection with the community who was served by the house for so long, which was the Eritrean community. And my, yeah, I spend a lot of time, especially in the evenings when I'm in Cali, with, with the Eritrean community. There's a small encampment um, near the football stadium of about 50, 50 young Eritrean men. And I spend time with them there around the far side, uh, eating and just being with them. So that's essentially my uh, sort of the, the, gives you an idea of the work I do in, in, in Cali. So I wonder, we're catching up with you going out to Calais in 2016, but you know, we don't usually suddenly decide to do something like that. Usually uh, it's something that's um, grown in us or there's some motivation or something along the way which has brought us to that point. So I, I wonder how it is that you end up doing this. <laughs> Liz, well, yes, it's, <laughs> well, I suppose on one level, it was curiosity, because in, in 2015, 2016, there was an awful lot in the media about the refugee community in Calais. And um, by 2016, um, the, what was called the jungle camp was temporary home to between eight and 10,000 people. So it was a huge, huge issue. And there were, it was also at the time when um, terrible numbers of people were drowning in the Mediterranean as they tried to cross from North Africa to, to Italy. So it was a big, it was a, it was a huge issue. I mean, both a humanitarian and a political issue. And it's been a huge um, political hot potato sort of thrown around Europe for several years now. But even before this, I guess the, uh, 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 the principal trigger really was in 2016, I had the chance to go and work as a human rights monitor in in the Palestinian West Bank and that was an extraordinary experience um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute but it was when I came back from Palestine um, in the late spring early summer of 2016 I met in London a young Palestinian um, who well to cut a long story short I uh, I kept in contact with her. I was just back from Palestine and, and, and fascinated by the culture and the people I've met. 
and she ended up returning to Palestine, coming back to the UK and, and asking for asylum here. And so she was, Suha was the first, as it were, individual refugee. There's so much in the press, but she was a first individual refugee that, that I got to know. And four years on, we're still very much in contact. Um, and she did a course at London School of Economics and um, just this year had a, had a baby. Um, but in Palestine, in Palestine in, well, right across the Middle East, there's huge numbers of Palestinian refugees. Obviously at the moment, because of the terrible war in Syria, um, there's many, many people living uprooted and, and homeless. But back in 2016, um, when I was in Palestine, I was aware of the huge numbers of Palestinians living in refugee camps. And they've been living in refugee camps since 1947 and the, um, and the, and the war in 1967. In fact, there's more Palestinians I think living in refugee camps right across the Middle East than there are actually Palestinians living in Palestine, in the West Bank or Gaza. So that was very much an inspiration. Um, and I became fascinated, I've become fascinated by, so I, 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 was, I was working with this organization called the Ecumenical Accompaniment Program in Palestine and Israel. And I love this word, accompanier or, or to accompany um, to uh, at, the, at the heart of that word being an accompanier is being a companion and for those of you who are interested in the the, the, the root of, of language and words the word companion holds the latin word cum panis with bread so you're effectively you're a you're a, a bread fellow with someone a messmate with someone you want your companion you're sharing their bread um, and this is what I did so often with people in Palestine, in, in, in just simply sit with people in often very dramatic and tragic circumstances, but sit with them and share the bread they offered to, to us as a little group. Um, and something which continues to inspire me, and I've still got the little bit of paper that I wrote th this down on, and I'll read it to you. One of the members of the guiding board for the ecumenical accompaniment program in Palestine and Israel is the Lutheran bishop, Dr. Muni Bemun, who's he's a Lutheran bishop for Jerusalem and the Holy Land. And he describes what being an accompanier or companion is. And he says this companions are witnesses of hope in a hopeless situation, witnesses of love in a world of hatred and retaliation, witnesses of faith in a world that ignores God, witnesses of truth in a world of propaganda and lies. And I've, I carried that little piece of paper into my interview in 2015, before I got on this, on, on the, on, before I came in a company. And it still inspires me now. And what I've learned at the heart too of being a companion is the importance to be a good companion you need to be present fully present to the person you're trying to accompany or be a companion to um, and i learned i learned about this the importance of just being present with other people in palestine i lived for three months we were a team of five in a tiny little village called yanun um, near nap for those of you who know uh, the west bank at all near nablus it was a tiny village of just five households. And it was a community that had been driven out in 2000 and 2002. They were driven out of their village um, by Israeli settlers who, who's, who, 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 whose community, they built houses all around Yanun. And the, the Palestinians were driven out of their village. And they were only able to return with the help of Israeli peace activists. And there's been an international presence in the village ever since, and, and we were that for three months. Um, and sadly, at the moment, because of COVID, there is no presence of, there's no ecumenical companies in Palestine at the moment. But perhaps my favorite times were, we always had to, someone always had to stay in the village. And I think this was particularly when I learned about presence because it was a day I really enjoyed. And that day I would spend while the other team members were out and about and um, meeting other communities. Staying in the village was about just being in the village. I would use the time to sit quietly on my own, to, to pray and meditate. 
and I'd also visit people. And just because my Arabic was minimal, um, I would often just sit with a family or an individual um, over a cup of coffee, um, communicating as best we can, but often just simply sitting with that other person or other people in stillness and silence. And I particularly remember um, of an evening, of several, many, many evenings going down just as the light was fading. I would walk down the hill to the house of Rashid, who was the, the mufti, the head man of the village. And at that time of the day, his, he had brought the sheep in. He was, he was a shepherd. He brought the sheep in and his wife and daughters were milking the sheep. And Rashid and I would sit outside around a, a brazier, of a hot brazier, um, sipping coffee. Um, Rashi would be smoking a cigarette and very often we said actually nothing we just looked out onto the the falling light and the, and the evening and yeah it was these were remarkable moments of just simply being alongside someone um, being as fully present as I could yes yeah, so I think to be an effective accompany or effective companion one needs to know how to be present to them Hmm. As, as you've been talking, Alex, I, I've been thinking probably when I introduced you, I said that you work with refugees. I can't remember, but we commonly do say that, that so-and-so works with refugees. And we'll probably have something in mind that they provide them with health care or advice or clothes or a shelter or... Um, charging their mobile phone or getting in contact with something. But what you're describing is something really very different. And it's and, and in the title you've chosen, you've you've said that very specifically. Meditation and accompanying refugees, not working with them. <laughs> and I what is it that's so I mean the, the refugees are very needy in all sorts of ways. I guess. So, so what is it for you that is accompanying? What's the importance of it, do you think? Well, it's, I, I was, I'm just thinking of, of a moment um, just about a month ago when I was sitting around the fire with the, my Eritrean companions and I said to the group around me, I said, look, no. I come every day to see you and I bring you nothing. I <laughs> drink the coffee or the tea you offer me. I share the food you prepare and offer me. Is this okay? I'm not bringing you anything. Because um, there are many different voluntary associations were, uh, you know, working in Calais and they bring people food or they bring people clothes. They charge their phones. They drive people to the hospital. Um, and here I am. I'm not bringing you anything. And there's, there was a guy, Mohammed, and he said to me, of course it's okay you are interested in us you want to learn about us and another guy solomon said to me and this really this really affected me he said you bring us hope and i i was really really humbled by when he said that and also deeply grateful because i realized that if i was bringing hope it was nothing to do with my hope because if I rationalize about the situation of, of the people I meet in Calais, it can often seem very hopeless. And, but, you know, the, again, this community I've got to know, the Eritrean community in, in Calais, when I was first in Calais in 2016, 2017, so many of the, the exiles, the refugees turning up there, had, well, you know, they were still new on their, relatively new on their travels. They've been traveling just perhaps for a few months from different parts of the world. But I'm now meeting people in Calais who have been in Europe for years. They've been, they've applied for asylum in Germany, perhaps, and have been kept waiting two, three, four, five. Someone told me the other day they've been waiting eight years and they're rejected. So if you, if, if I think about from a rational point of view, I, I, it's not my hope I'm bringing people. And I, and I suppose that feeling of incredible gratitude I felt was, was I sensed that there was something greater than me they were receiving from um, and I've thought more and more about that role of a companier and about if one wants to be an effective companion or a companier 
you have to put your <laughs> you have to put yourself to one side and allow something much greater to come through you as it were and i suppose this is one of the great lessons i've learned in in my practice of meditation because as in the words of john main our practice is about taking the spotlight of consciousness off ourselves and in jesus words, it's about dying to self and it's about dying to that small that ego self that program conditioned self to enable something much greater to to emerge the true self that's rooted in god and when Sele said to me you bring us hope all i could think was was um in huge gratitude that for, for a little while i'm able to be something something greater than me happening um so yeah i'm not bringing you say i'm not bringing people stuff as it were I can only come as I am, and I and I, I think coming as I am is what I, I've hugely I, I've been strengthened in coming as I am, who I am, um, through my practice of meditation. Um, and I think there's something else here too, because um, it's about coming in purity and honest. It's about you know, me coming who I am, not trying to pretend to be what I'm not. And I suppose an elemental part of our practice of meditation is, is healing. We're opening ourselves up to being healed, to being cleansed, to being purified, to being transformed. Um, and if I am able to be um, in any way supportive of my, my brothers and sisters, as it were, um, then, yeah, I need to be as pure and honest and as much me, me as I can be, um, the me that's hopefully taking the spotlight of consciousness of the, the ego me, the me, me, me that uh, has been so much the centre of my life for all my earlier years anyway. Um, Again, as I'm listening, I, I have a sense that to do that, to just go as yourself, you know, with nothing in your hands there's a sort of deep trust in that a deep trust in yourself and what's beyond yourself that that, that that's enough <laughs> <laughs> and through that a sort of a, a sort of a, a trust and a humility involved in it <laughs> well it's um I said, what, what, again, what, one of the most beautiful things I've been, you know, what I participate in, you know, when, when, particularly when the young guys were living in the house, um, in Maris, Maria Skob Silver House, I mean, still prayer, as I said, is, is, is a central part of the house. But when the young Eritreans were in the house, they would lead night prayer. So um, in, in their own language, in Tigrinya, which is the main language in Eritrea, but we, every evening we would, I would, and those, the volunteers in the house, we would gather and pray with the guests in the house. And one of the most poignant moments um, is on a Sunday, I joined the Eritrean Orthodox community outside, just praying on a, on a, on a, piece, on a piece of tarmac, um, ironically, um, gathered around a no entry sign, which has a cross <laughs> and various rosaries hanging from it. Um, and then I was there, you know, um, there's very often a, um, in fact, prayer only happens when there's a, a deacon from within the, the from within the religious, from within the um, Eritrean community, um, and there usually is a, um, a young deacon. And there we were praying, the, the, the gendarmerie turn up with two, <laughs> two minibus loads full of fully armed police, and they're filming us, and they are just watching, and this is, but to be with this community and pray with them is something that I, th I think brings that bond closer when you can actually be, even though the prayer is in Tigrini and I don't understand anything, but it's just being there and praying with them. Um, I, think, I think that enables that feeling of trust to grow between us um, because they immediately see we, sh we, we all share something in common here. Um, a belief in the centrality of God. Mm. Um, mm. And, and, I, and it's, um, yes, I mean, something, there's, a, there's, a, there's another aspect, of, you know, there's another aspect of our practice of meditation. Um, I call it thinning the boundaries. <laughs> yeah. Um, because 
you know, we, we, we live in a world of boundaries. Boundaries are very important. Um, and particularly at the moment, what, I mean, I'm aware that we're constantly having to negotiate boundaries with people. I mean, any one day, um, I might be greeting people because of COVID. I might be greeting people in a normal way with a big embrace. I might be two meters away with a mask in front of my face. I might be greeting people with touching by elbow. We're constantly having to negotiate boundaries. And I'm aware in our, through our practice of meditation, there's something shift, something shifts on a spiritual level in our sense of boundary between what is me and mine and, and you and yours. And those boundaries thin, I think, through the, through the weeks and months and years of, of, of leaving self behind, those boundaries between me and the other, uh, me and the other person thin, and drawn towards people through the, through the barrier of boundary on a spiritual level, we're drawn closer through love. And this isn't, this, is, this isn't something intrusive. I'm not pushing my way into, into your personal space. It's a sort of natural osmosis of love that, and of course, which is a very wonderful thing because it draws, it draws one closer to other people. But the, you know, I, and I can talk more about this in a minute, but I often, there are various aspects of, of our practice of Christian meditation that I think should come with a health warning. Um, and I suppose, this is one of them because in being drawn closer to other people, yes, you, you engage more with their joys, but yes, you feel their pain more. You're drawn into other people's pain. Um, and that, that, that can be very difficult. Um, but yes, it's, so it's, <laughs> this is one of the, one of the, one of the, um, the aspects of our practice of Christian meditation, that thinning of boundaries and, but that, and that thing, thinning of boundaries enables one to, in a sense, empathize with, with others, draws you closer to them, you feel their pain, you feel their, you feel their love, you feel their warmth, you feel their joys. And so it's, has, it's, there are many blessings and many you know, challenging aspects to that. I mean, I mean, clearly a lot of people who work with refugees don't have a meditation practice. It's not essential in, in one sense, yet, it seems as though it is essential for you. <laughs> well, I, <laughs> it's true. I can, but I can really only talk about my own, my own personal experience here. So, um, you know, why why is it so important for you in 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 doing this accompanying that you're doing this work that you're doing? Well, I didn't know it was till, till ah. <laughs> I was challenged with. This con by the, by, by, and, and by this conversation, and I've reflected in, in, in reflecting about what it is, what's going on, um, um, and, 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 and there's another as there's another aspect of this which I'd like to say a little bit about. Um, mm. Again, and it, it, it touches on <laughs> meditation with the health warning, um, because you and I, you know, we we we, we met uh, one of the early occasions where it was giving te essential teaching. Um, leading essential teaching weekends, and I and I guess I've been you know, I've been privileged to be able to share um, something about our tradition with with many people, and I often include that aspect of the health warning because I think one of the unanticipated consequences of our practice is a, a well recognised um, consequence of regularly going to stillness and silence, is that we what happens is stuff we've suppressed in our unconscious, stuff that was too hard to deal with when we were young, um, emotional trauma, you know, regularly going into stillness in silence can loosen this stuff up. Um, and this is not necessarily what we expected when we embark on this way of prayer. Um, but in, in, in my own personal, my own personal experience, something that's an aspect of my buried past that has emerged is feelings of rejection and loss in childhood um, and that over the years gradually kind of started <laughs> loosening up and coming to the surface level of consciousness and sort of crashing into my day-to-day -day. Um, but what that's done and, and it took time to for all of us for when this happens we need to first of all be aware that it does happen and 
and embrace and accept and open ourselves to the healing of this, which is absolutely possible. Um, but what it does is what I've realized it does through my own experience of loss and rejection in childhood and re-encountering this, it draws me closer to other people who are reject or feel rejected or who, who have, have feeling loss and rejection. And there's a, I have a, a, a good friend who, um, when, I'm, when I'm trying to talk about what I encounter in Calais, and particularly um, when I'm talking about it to people who have a certain negativity towards the whole idea of refugees and accepting asylum seekers into the country, I try and humanize the whole, the whole issue by talking about individual stories. And I've been telling this friend about a particular person who had a really terrible, terrible experience traveling from Eritrea to, 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 to Europe. Um, he was in something like eight different um, traffickers detention centers in, in, in Libya. You can be, Libya is, is a living hell for um, refugees passing through. I mean, you're, you're taken as a commodity and you're bought and sold and tortured. So I was telling this person about um, this young man. And then uh, I'd finished speaking. There was a kind of moment of silence. And she said, well, Alex, she said, the truth is, not, not a long silence. The truth is nobody wants these people. And when I heard this, I'm thinking these people are the individuals I meet, who I, I pray with, I eat with, I, I share their food with them. They are individuals no different to, to you and I who essentially want to get on with their life, who want to love and be loved. Um, so uh, these are people, these are people who are often being rejected by the societies they find themselves in. And there was another really, really, there was a moment uh, I will never forget too. Um, it was a, nearly a year ago, I was driving an Iranian man and his son back to the, his, his wife and daughter were living in Maria Skorbseva house, but there was no room for, for him and his son. And I was driving them back to the forested area where they were camped with, with a group of other Iranians. And it was about quarter to 12 at night and we arrived where I was to drop them off. And it was incredibly quiet. Everyone seemed to have gone to sleep. And beside the road, there was this glowing orange tent and the tent was, was, a, was, there was several candles inside and a photograph of a young man. And essentially it was, it was a shrine to this young Nigerian who the week before October, it was getting cold and he had taken a small brazier into his, into his tent to keep himself warm, zipped up the tent and had died of carbon monoxide poisoning. And when his friends were interviewed by the media the following week, one of them asked the question, why does nobody want us? And there's this huge sense of rejection amongst the refugee community. As I said, I've met many people now in Calais who've been in other European countries for years and have had their asylum application rejected after many years. They're, they're kicked around different countries of Europe. There's this, yeah, and, and, and I think it's my own experience of rejection in early child loss and rejection that that I've that surfaced through my practice of medicine, that again enables me to to just draw closer to, to a whole community that, have, that feel this sense of rejection so yeah I mean I think I've learned I mean I've I've you know, I, I I've only I've reflected about this a lot over the last few days in before um, our conversation now um, and I certainly, when I went into this work, I was drawn into it or attracted it, it as I said, out of curiosity um, and have stayed with it because I've been really touched by the people I've met um, and, and I've become aware just how, in order for me personally to function in this world, A, my practice of meditation enables me to do it um, and to be and to be present. And that thing of being present is so elemental to our practice of meditation. Um, we learn to be present in the present moment to the indwelling presence. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, 
it seems it seems absolutely elemental to how how I'm able to do this work. I, I, I don't know if that ans answers your question. Uh, I, I mean, it certainly does. I mean, that phrase is absolutely elemental to to you doing it. it re really sums up how deeply important it is. And 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 you've talked about experiences of re rejection, your own personally, and the rejection of refugees and so i guess that that title that you've chosen where is home <laughs> brings you and the refugees together does it this this search for home <laughs> wow i mean it, it that's it's true yeah and i've thought yeah again just a lot recently about belonging and where where is home um in fact there was an article in yesterday's sunday observer called no place like home and it was an article about the evictions going on at the moment um, because you know, because of the economic downturn people aren't getting the money they need to pay their rent and there's a whole kind of substrata of unregulated private rents that go on and people are being evicted and that place, no place like home where is home um, i'm living or i'm i'm in, encountering engaged with a commu whole communities that have been uprooted um, and I, I, I must read you this, I'll read you a quote, um, two quotes I've come across recently by people who, well-known people who have experienced this uprootedness. Um, this is Simon Vey, who um, is well-known within our Christian meditation community for, for, her, incredible, for her incredible wisdom and, and, and spiritual depth. Simon Vey, who was French, um, had to escape from Nazi occupation of France as, as, as a Jewish person. And so she knew what it was to be uprooted. She left France um, in 1942, I think, and sailed to New York and eventually came to, to England and, and died in, in 1943. And she says this, to be rooted is perhaps the most important and least recognized need of the human soul. Uprootedness is by far the most dangerous malady to which human societies are exposed. And here I am amongst these people who, this com these communities of people from all over the world who have been uprooted by war, by persecution, by autocratic political um, dictatorships. And just reading, I mean, I, I mean, I have, I have no sense, I have no experience, and I mean, I come, I think we both come from from very privileged communities where we haven't experienced this uprootedness, um, and it's there, but for the grace of God, go you and I and others in this position, and I was just thinking about this particularly in, in, after the terrible explosion in Beirut three weeks ago. And apart from the terrible tragedy of the many people who lost their lives and who were very, very badly wounded, there were thousands, if not tens of thousands of people who would have gone out that morning to go about their business and their homes were destroyed. Suddenly, the place they called home was gone, you know, just in, 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 in a flash. There's some... Um, no, I, I, people will have heard of another remarkable writer and thinker, a Palestinian, Edward Said, who was also uh, an exile, um, Palestinian living in New York, uh, who's, who's, no, who's no longer, who's, who's now died. But he wrote uh, an essay called Reflections on Exile. And he, he writes this, exile is terrible to experience. It is the unbearable rift forced between a human being and a native place between the self and its true home. So it's, you know, it's left me thinking, you know, where is my true home? Where is our true home? Where is home for the uprooted person? And I met this, I've met this recently in July, um, a wonderful young Eritrean guy called Jonas. And Jonas speaks virtually fluent English. And we've had some wonderful conversations because you know, often, <laughs> as I've said, the, the, the accompaniment of being the companion is, can be just, uh, when, when the language is limited, it can be quite a silent uh, company. But with certain people, and particularly with Jonas, we've had great conversations about some, all sorts of things. And, and, and Jonas writes, he shared a piece of his writing with me, and he writes very well in English. Um, and 
last week I sent, I came across some wonderful words of uh, a German philosopher, philosopher, Theodor Adorno. And I sent him these words and he, he, he sent me back just a little heart saying he loved them. And Theodore Adorno writes this. In his text, the writer sets up house. For someone who no longer has a homeland, writing becomes a place to live. And for Jonas, who has been shunted around Europe for several years, trying to find a place to begin his life again, it seemed to me that where he was finding his home at the moment was in his writing. Um, and I'm really glad I found these words and was able to send them to him. And uh, he's found them really valuable. And I'm just trying to encourage him with his writing. And he also said something to me which deeply affected me. He's a very sensitive guy. He said to me, Alex, he said, sometimes I feel guilty for the problems we're causing here. And here's a guy who's been <laughs> uprooted, yet feeling guilty about you know, the, the problems refugees are, uh, you know, because it's, you know, there's no doubt that a, a huge population of refugees in a, in a small town and it creates all sorts of challenges and difficulties. And here's this young guy feeling guilty about it. Um, yeah, wonderful, sensitive young man. So yeah, where is home? And I guess, <laughs> Um, none of us can prepare for the uprootedness that experienced by the people I'm meeting in, in Calais. But I guess some of us, in, in, in a way, and I don't know whether you would agree with me, Liz, but something of the, of, of the discovery through our practice of silence, of silent prayer, of contemplative prayer, of Christian meditation, is we begin to learn where our true home is. <laughs> Our true home is, is in the, at the heart of our being and in the loving embrace of the, of the inner dwelling Christ, the inner dwelling divine. And, and we're held there in these all embracing arms. And that's where our true home is. And the wonderful thing I've been talking about boundaries and all negotiating of boundaries and the boundaries we put up to keep people away, the boundaries, countries. You know, people talk now about fortress Europe and all, all over the world we're putting up fences and and, and, and trying to put out walls to stop people you know, moving around the place. But the one relationship within which there are no bounds, it's boundless, it's our, it's our relationship with God. It's, 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 that's, and that's where home is, it's within that boundless, boundary-free relationship with, with the indwelling divine. And I suppose, yes, that's becoming ever more my discovery through through the regular practice of, of, Christian, of Christian meditation. And I hope it, I truly hope it's the, the same discovery of, of other fellow practitioners of this wonderful way of prayer. And you said, would, did, would I agree with that for myself? And, um, and I certainly would. And I suppose you know, it's a much smaller challenge than being a refugee. But, you know, Graham died back in January. We both obviously know no, Graham, and I think that's this is the time for me of um, digging in, in into a, another layer of where home might be. <laughs> Anything when something's taken away from you, whatever it is that's part of your belonging and your home, then I think um, it opens up the possibility, um, frequently partly painful and partly joyful, of of finding that place of home at a, an even deeper level than you had imagined before. So yeah, I, I would certainly agree with you on that. Alex, it's been, I don't think, what, what, what you won't know is how joyful you look <laughs> as you've been talking. And that's a great gift in itself. So uh, thank you for this conversation and I know you had a quote about meditation that you might just want to round off with would you or well, I'll say it for you <laughs> is, is this the quotation from Hugo of St Victor um it's Which well let, it? let, let, let me read it I've got it written on a piece of paper that you gave me but I can equally okay. well read it meditation maybe you wrote it yourself but I think it's it, it sums it up meditation there is only one true home in the intimate arms of the intimately loving Christ, a relationship beyond boundaries, 
a learning to be at home in the present with the ever present spirit. Thank you. Thanks very much, Liz.